five incredible mastering hacks you need to know in Ozone 10. Some of these are going to be Ozone specific, some of these are just good mastering practices, but what I know for sure is by the end of this video, you're going to be a better engineer. It's the analog vlog. It's a vlog, analog. How would you feel if the mastering engineer you just paid $300 to used Ozone to master your music? Perhaps not great, but I gotta be honest here. Ozone is one of the most capable and comprehensive mastering tools currently on the market. I personally know several mastering engineers who charge north of $200 who use Ozone 10 exclusively, and that's okay. If anything, more power to them for knowing their tools inside and out and being able to cut down on revision time. Imagine knowing any tool so well that people would pay you hundreds to use it. Musicians, you know what I'm talking about. Well, I can't teach you everything there is to know about Ozone 10 in just one video, but I would love to show you five ways you can use Ozone 10 to instantly up your mastering game. Of course, the number one way you could instantly up your mastering game is by liking this video, commenting, subscribing, and ringing the bell. And now, let's get to the list. Number one, less is more. Here's a mastering mentality that I hold to. Not everyone does, but it's served me well so far in my career. Mastering is like golf. The goal of golf is to play the least amount of golf hit the ball the least number of times. Same goes for mastering. The less I have to touch a track to get it over the finish line, the better the end product is going to be. Just because you have 17 different modules to choose from in Ozone does not mean you should use all 17 or even half of them. For that matter, just because Master Assistant pulls up six modules doesn't mean you should use all six on every song. So here's the important thing to do every time. Step one, set your loudness based on the commercial expectations of your song, style, and genre. Put together a playlist of tunes you'd like your song to be in a playlist next to. Make sure you have normalization turned off in, a, in whatever streaming service you're using and use that as a guide. Step two, ask yourself, how does this sound? If the answer is fucking amazing, stop. You're done mastering, don't do anything else. If you do anything else, you'll either ruin it or you're gonna waste two hours of your life throwing the whole kitchen sink at it before realizing all you really had to do was turn it up. If the answer was, I'm still not convinced, proceed to step three. Step three, adjust your tonal balance to the commercial expectations of your style and genre. Remember that playlist you made? Use the same songs. And again, less is more here. That's the principle we're talking about. Use something like a Bax or a Poltec. Don't go crazy with 64 bands of surgical EQ. We don't do that. This is a Manly Massive Passive Mastering Edition. It's a $7,000 EQ. It's got four bands. Four is plenty. Step four, ask yourself, how does it sound? If the answer is amazing, stop. You're done mastering. Don't do anything else. Hit bounce, grab yourself a beer, congratulate yourself on a job well done. If the answer is still, I'm still not convinced, proceed to step five. Step five, if you're still not convinced, there's probably something funky going on in the mix. Either fix it in the mix and then come back and do steps one through four again, or hire a specialist like one of the engineers here at Boards of Mastering to do what we do best. Number two, the new stabilizer is garbage as a processor, but you can still learn from it. Every tool we have at our disposal as audio engineers or when we're wearing the audio engineer hat comes with compromise. We get a bit of this at the expense of that. You want loudness, you lose dynamics. You want brightness, you lose darkness. What the stabilizer is offering you is active and continuous EQ adjustments to push your song towards a target curve based on genre expectations, which sounds great in theory until you realize the compromise. What you're sacrificing for that tonal shift is dynamics, both on a micro and a macro level. Micro, each individual transient hit. Your kick drum, while it was originally stable and the anchor of the song is now kicking and moving up or kicking and moving down every time. Macro dynamics, you worked really hard on the difference between the verse and the chorus and you wanted that chorus to explode. And now because the genre expectation is here and the verse is down here, the whole verse is pushed up 4 dB. And then when the chorus hits, which is up here, but the genre expectations are down here, the chorus is pushed down a bit. So now that you've worked really hard for verse to chorus and now it's a bit like this. But don't dismiss the stabilizer entirely. There's still things we can learn from it if we look at it more as a meter than a processor. So if a part of your song is arranged so that the kick drum drops out for eight bars for musical effect, you want the kick drum to go, to go, the song lives up here and boom, the kick drum's back in and the song continues in its big musical effect. If you do that, your stabilizer is going to boost the low end because the low end expectation for your genre is where it's at and there's no kick drum in this part of the song. So the stabilizer is like, well, wait a minute, I need to boost so much low end to meet this genre expectation. Objectively, that's wrong. You chose to arrange it in a certain way and the stabilizer is going against that. 
That kind of stuff throw out the window, don't pay attention to that. But here's what you could pay attention to. Say you have a vocalist and the vocalist stops singing and a guitar comes in for a guitar solo. And when the vocal stops singing and the guitar pops in, you see the stabilizer all of a sudden, boom, it's got this big lump right at 1K. That might be indicating to you that either your guitar is too quiet entirely or the 1K range of your guitar is too quiet. There's a gap there that wants to be filled that isn't filled. Stabilizer is trying to fix it with active EQ you're better off going in and either turning up your guitar fully or boosting that range of the guitar just to fill in that part of the spectrum. Long story short, use the stabilizer to point out to you potential frequency buildups or gaps in your mix, but then turn it off and fix those areas with something that's actually stable, an EQ. Number three, the order of operators is paramount. Here's another general mastering tip that if you know, you know, but if you don't, it could change your life. It's the audio engineer chicken or egg question. What comes first, the EQ or the compressor? The answer, of course, is it depends. A 1 dB EQ bell before a limiter sounds wildly different than a 1 dB bell after that same limiter. I know I'm not the only mastering engineer that loves to stack limiters and EQs. Oftentimes, rather than spinning up one instance of the full Ozone 10, I will pull out the individual modules as their own plugins. The benefits here are twofold. Number one, of course, going back to our original tip of the day, less is more. You're gonna work with more intentionality if you work this way. And number two, unlimited maximizers. <laughs> A good default chain if you're looking for one, this goes along with the same chain that I was showing you in my last video, the you're using your limiter wrong video. Put these plugins in this order and start here. Number one, ozone tape. Uh, leave this bypassed for now, just have it up. Number two, an EQ. Number three, dynamics. Feel free to swap these once you get things going. Number four, a maximizer. To make this behave closest to a clipper, IRC2, set the character to fastest, set the stereo to fully independent or fully unlinked. And lastly, Vintage Limiter. Tube with the character set at uh, 0.25 sounds great to my ears. Dial in the maximizer first. If you still need more loudness, then reach for the Vintage Limiter. Then move forward with dialing in your EQ. If at this point you are lacking depth, thickness, glue, you could try either the compressor or the Vintage Tape. One will work, one probably won't. One of them's gonna work better than the other. That's it, that's the chain. Less is more, keep it simple. Number four, the Ozone 10 EQ is an absolute game changer. Speed is one of the things I value very highly. I have to master and deliver 200 plus songs a month. If I can find a tool that makes a song sound like a record quickly, that tool is worth its weight in gold. The Ozone EQ has quickly become one of my go-to equalizers. Even though I love the ergonomics and usability of the FabFilter Pro Q3, Ozone has some tricks up its sleeve. There are four different shelf shapes, and all of them are modeled after classic EQ shapes. Shapes that you've heard a million times on a million different records. More importantly, if you want to get these shapes with FabFilter or other digital plugins, sometimes you have to use two, three, or four bands to do what Ozone is doing with one. The main takeaway here, set up a preset for yourself with the Ozone EQ where all eight bands are shelves. Four low shelves, four high shelves. Each one of them a different shape. Place them strategically in the spectrum. You'll be amazed how quickly you'll be able to get your music to sound like a record. Number five, Level up your mastering game by playing man versus machine. One of my favorite things to do with Ozone is use it as a second pair of ears in the room. First thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna master the song, start to finish until I'm extraordinarily happy with it. Then I'll make a copy of the mix, drag it to a new channel, I'll put Ozone 10 on it, and I'll run Master Assistant. See what the machine comes up with versus my master. 99 out of 100 times, I like my master better. I certainly would hope so. If an algorithm was beating me consistently, I should probably look into other careers. But I let the assistant do its thing. And then I get to see what choices it made, tonally, dynamically, imaging, loudness. And then I get to decide if I want to incorporate any of those choices or say, nah, Ozone, you're crazy. For someone who's just starting out in mastering, or for those of you who are producers, mixing engineers, artists, the master assistant is an extraordinarily valuable tool. Do a master and then run assistant. Don't run the assistant first. It's going to affect your judgment. And don't lean on it too hard. It usually makes good decisions but it isn't magic. And good music and a good master should feel like magic. In the comments below, tell me which of the five tips you found most helpful and why. And if you have any hacks of your own, leave them in the comments as well. I'd love to hear what you come up with. You know, the real bummer about this setup is I can't see what the battery life is on my microphone. I have one more tip to share you. It's amazing. The best thing you could do is I'm telling you, if you do this, you will get gold records. There's no way you could possibly not get a Grammy if you do that technique. It's amazing. You gotta do it.